And you see, who are you? Tell us a little bit <laughs> about your background. Where do you live? What do you do? And what are you doing? Why are you smiling like this? <laughs> I'm not sure why I'm smiling. Um, I, well, long story short, I live in Russia. I live in Tumen, which is even further east than Yekaterinburg, the easternmost World Cup host city in a little Siberian city called Tumen. I came out as an English teacher, but it's not really what I wanted to do. And I got to know the local club and, you know, ball started rolling. I started writing about Russian football, learning about Russian football, getting accreditation for Russian football. And then the World Cup came along, of course. So long story short, what I'm doing here for the tournament is driving to every World Cup host city. And today I completed my task. I came to my 11th host city, St. Petersburg and I will drive in total something like 18,000 kilometers. I have only stayed about seven nights in an actual bed out of 26, 27 nights. I lose track of days, of dates, of where I am, but I just know where I've got to be next. But right now, St. Petersburg and the Krestovsky, so that's why I'm smiling. Explain us, how a person decides to go on a tour throughout this whole huge country of Russia and visit each World Cup city in this competition? Yeah, it's, it's a number of factors. Um, I'd like to say, uh, it wouldn't be entirely truthful, but I'd like to say it was all a romantic idea of life on the road, but it all started from firstly not getting match tickets, not getting accreditation, because FIFA World Cup is an absolute madhouse trying to get all this accreditation. And I thought, well, I live only 300 kilometers from one World Cup host city, Yekaterinburg. And I thought, well, I've got to, at the very least, go to Yekaterinburg. So I told one of my editors, Chris, I said, look, Chris, I'm gonna to go to Yekaterinburg. Do you want me to make some content? And he said, why only go to Yekaterinburg? Why stop there? Let's go to all World Cup cities. I said, look, Chris, I've gotta be honest, it's gonna cost a lot of money. 33 days on the road, the petrol involved with, like I say, about 18,000 kilometers. And he said, well, look, I'll tell you what, I'll do my best, I'll put my head together, try and get a little bit of funds together, help you out on the petrol front. If I can do that, do you want to go? And I said, yeah, no problem. That was before I knew what life was like sleeping in a car. I swear to God, it is, it's a nightly battle trying to find the right petrol station with not too much lighting from above so it wakes you up, not too much security who knock on your window to tell you to move on, not too many people passing by. It's... Um, Oh, Christ, it's, it's, it's mad. It's madness. How I came to do it, that's why I came to do it. Uh, do I regret doing it? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure what the answer is to that question at the moment. <laughs> no, I don't regret doing it. I wouldn't do it again, but I'm glad I have done it because it is an achievement. Quite what the achievement is, I'm not really sure. And I don't think many people are going to be challenging me to try and do that. Um, although I have met two other people doing the same sort of thing. There was a Spanish guy who cycled all the way from Spain to Moscow, and there was a German guy who has driven to every South African World Cup host city in 2010 and his home World Cup in uh, 2006, and then, um, and then he's driven here as well. But I'm the only one going to every Russian World Cup host city, so yes. <laughs> And how many matches have you literally seen? Matches I've actually attended, one. Uh, and even that was a very last minute thing. The whole fan ID system, which actually I think is very good, it's helped with security. I understood it to be, you had to have a ticket first. And technically that is true, but I may have slightly twisted the rules a bit and uh, borrowed somebody else's ticket to get myself a fan ID, which I did only about five days ago. And whilst I was in the ID centre, I looked at the FIFA website and I saw a ticket available for the England quarterfinal against Sweden, uh, which I was going to the next day, bought the ticket, and it was actually that simple. So I now regret not getting the fan ID earlier and trying to get tickets for games in more cities, but at least I got to one. I got to see my country in the quarterfinal, so that was great. That was fantastic. Um, so only one, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Now, I want you to tell me the craziest and the wackiest part or moment you had in your trip in this World Cup. <laughs> oh, blimey. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a few, it's quite a few to be fair. I think really one of, the, one of the maddest things has been meeting Alejandro Maldonado. Uh, now, this was a Mexican guy. 
Um, he's about 59, 60 years old. I was in Rostov and my job is largely outside the stadiums, not inside the games. So I've got to meet the fans and my boss sets me challenges, have a kickabout with some fans. He said, take a ball, play a bit of football with them. So outside Rostov Arena, there was Alejandro and a couple of Russian guys. So I said, oh guys, can we have a game? And said, yeah, sure. So we're playing keepy uppy and Alejandro speaks perfect, perfect uh, English. And so I, I ask him who he is, where he's from. It turns out, now this is just absolutely mad. Outside Rostov Arena at the World Cup, I meet Alejandro Maldonado, a Mexican man who moved to England when he was 17. He only had $100 in his pocket. He ended up playing football in the Isthmian League, which is the seventh or eighth tier down in England. He played for Hendon, he played for Leighton Stone, and he then went back to Las Vegas, set up a team for Mexican expats, and they played in the local tournament against, get this, I don't even care if he was making this up, it sounded so good at the time, he played against Rod Stewart's team when Rod Stewart was performing out in Las Vegas and he beat them. It's just fantastic. How on earth is there even a person that exists like Alejandro, yet alone would I meet him, yet alone in Russia, outside a stadium? It was just absolutely mad. I loved it. I talked to Alejandro for two, three hours after the game. It was pitch black by the time I had to go home. Well, when I say home, I mean my car, which is my home. Um, absolutely mad i love that and alejandro is even going to come and visit me in siberia because he loved the idea that somebody lives in siberia so we'll see how mad it gets uh, you've been to 11 cities in all of russia that world cup matches took place at. can you sum up the impact of the tournament on this country as someone who also visited during the tournament but also live here yeah, I mean, where I live in Siberia, there was no World Cup fever. And I mean, I've not been there, obviously, I've been driving around, but I can pretty much guarantee that the pubs would not even be full, even for the Russia games. I mean, I watched the opening game, Russia against Saudi Arabia. Yes, not a most glamorous fixture, but it's the opening game of the World Cup in your home country. And there was me, Johnny, an Irishman, and two other people in the entire pub. This was on a Thursday night. Okay, it's not Friday, no, but it's, the, it's nearly the weekend. It's your home country playing in the World Cup and hardly anybody was there. But what I've seen in all of the host cities is, and it has helped that Russia, the national team themselves, have way overperformed what anybody expected. Um, everybody is suddenly patriotic. Now, Russians are patriotic, but in a kind of a different way. They like to complain, they like to whinge about things that are wrong in their country. But for the first time in a long time, I've lived here for nearly nine years, they're actually saying positive things about their own country. You know, people are chanting Juba, Juba. Juba was sent out on loan last season. He was deemed so useless. He should have been playing all season in this stadium for Zenit. And he went out on loan to Arsenal Tula, a nothing team in mid table. And suddenly he's a national hero. You know, um, you know, I, I say actually more important even than that though, for me, the effect I've seen is Russians mixing with foreign people. And I mean it in a good way from both perspectives. The, the image of Russian people that has been painted by so many lazy journalists has been of rude, racist, homophobic, closed people. And I have known pretty much from day one, from what I've seen, from what I know, that the complete opposite is true. I'm not talking about the politicians, I'm not talking about the leaders, and there are huge problems in this country, and I'm not denying any of that, and this is not to gloss over it, but the people should not be tired with that brush. And what I've seen is Russians mixing with foreigners and, Rus and foreigners mixing with Russians. I've seen English people chanting, Russia, Russia. I mean, I'm not the only person to see this, but I've, I've seen it myself in all the cities. There's no animosity. People realize that the people, and this for me is the most important thing, the people themselves are nothing like the image that has been painted. There, yes, there are issues that need to be addressed after the tournament. When the foreigners leave the country, then all of the niceties that have been going on will revert back, at least in part, to what I mean about the problems, the attitudes to other people, the consideration of others, the attitudes towards people of different backgrounds. But I strongly believe that the dialogue's been opened. 
and the path is going towards an improved future. And now, I, mean, I don't want to get too emotional about it, but it genuinely is the effect I've seen. And that's what I think is the power of the World Cup. And for me, it's been fantastic to see that. Here's the hardest question. Describe your experience in this World Cup in one word. <sighs> Wordless. There are no words. I mean, there are millions and there are none. It's, it's a bit like Russia. I, Christ, one word. You, you, you drive a hard bargain at Babagol, I'll give you that. Um, Christ, okay, one word, one word. Um, I don't know, you're just too cruel. I, unique. It's not, an, it's not original, but seriously, I genuinely don't think a World Cup will ever be quite like this, just because of the country Russia is, the, the relationship between Russia and other people, and the, the way the, the World Cup was awarded, the way it was hosted, the distances. I mean, yes, other World Cups are going to be fantastic. I'm not denying that, but none will be quite like Russia. And that's not me being biased. So I guess, I guess unique, I'll have to say unique. All right, now you accomplished your mission, you fulfilled your dream. What is the next target? You would think I would treat myself to a long lie-in and a stroll by the Moskva River, but no, even before the morning, I will be setting off about two hours after the World Cup to drive home because all this attention on the World Cup, the biggest stars, all this money, the attention, the fans, none of that comes even close in my heart to FC Tumen. The Russian domestic season starts two days after the World Cup final. So I have less than 48 hours to get from the Luzhniki to the Geolog Stadium in Tumen for FC Tumen against Baltica Kaliningrad. And, whisper it quietly, I'm going to watch that game before I even see my wife, who I've not seen for 34 days. I've told her, but, you know, she's probably not going to be happy. Football first. <laughs> That's the challenge.